Hi there. This video is an introduction to, you guessed it, simple machines. These clever little contraptions might sound simple. You might have even learned about some of them before, but as we'll see, there is a lot more to these simple mechanical devices than meets the eye. So let's get started. Simple machines are really a first step toward understanding the field of mechanics, which is the branch of technology dealing with motion and the forces that produce motion. Or you can think about mechanics as the machinery or the working parts of something. Mechanical engineers design all sorts of machines to do all sorts of useful work. And those machines can become incredibly complex with hundreds of intricate moving parts that each perform an important job. But when we start to look closely and study the simplest parts of advanced mechanical technologies, we often find that we are studying the six basic simple machines. A simple machine is a mechanical device used to change the direction or magnitude of a force. Sometimes the force you have available to move or lift something, like the power from a motor or maybe your muscles, isn't enough to get the job done. Sometimes the force needs to be applied in a different direction, other times the force needs to be increased. Simple machines make work easier by trading force for distance. That means we don't get something for nothing. If a machine lets us lift a heavy load using less force, then the trade-off is that we will have to move a greater distance in order to move the load a smaller distance. It all depends on the amount of mechanical advantage we get from a machine. The more a simple machine helps to decrease the effort needed to do work, the more mechanical advantage it has. Mechanical advantage is something we can measure and quantify. It's an actual number that can be used to reliably calculate how much a machine helps us. With a higher mechanical advantage, less force is required to move things. Sometimes a large mechanical advantage is what you need for a situation. Other situations might call for little or no mechanical advantage. One is the magic number. A machine with a mechanical advantage of one to one has no mechanical advantage. It exerts the same amount of force onto the load that you exert onto the machine. Machines like this can still help us in some ways, like allowing us to push down with a downward force in order to lift a load up. A mechanical advantage greater than one, like for example, two to one, means you exert less force on the machine than it exerts onto the load. But the trade-off is that you must move the force through a greater distance than the load moves. A mechanical advantage less than one, like one to two, means you are exerting more force onto the machine than it exerts onto the load. The trade-off is that then the load moves farther than you had to move. So in situations where not a lot of force is needed, but you don't have much room to move on the input, you can move a small distance and get the load to move farther on the output. As we'll see, different simple machines can provide mechanical advantage in lots of different ways. The mechanical advantage of a machine is the number of times it multiplies the input force to move a load. Mechanical advantage is expressed as a ratio of the distance of the effort over the distance of the resistance or load. Another way to express mechanical advantage is to use the output or resistance force over the input or effort force. This ratio is the same as the ratio of the effort distance over the resistance distance, in theory. Level two of the simple machine lesson will explain how this isn't always the case. The formula of effort distance over resistance distance can be used to find the mechanical advantage of any of the simple machines, but knowing how to find these distances for a given machine can be a little tricky. I'll explain as we go. First, let's talk about levers. Levers are one of the simplest and most intuitive of the simple machines. We use them every day without even realizing it. In fact, it would be tough to avoid them. They're everywhere, and by changing the way they are configured, we can get them to behave in lots of different ways. This is a good time to get a few terms straight. A lever is a rigid bar resting on a pivot, used to help move a heavy or firmly fixed load with one end when pressure is applied to the other. The pivot point that a lever turns around is called a fulcrum. The effort is the force being applied to a simple machine by a power source, and the load is the resistance force encountered by a simple machine from the thing it's trying to move. There are different ways to construct a lever. 
but all of them use the same few ingredients, a bar, a fulcrum, an effort force, and a resistance force. In a first-class lever, the fulcrum is positioned in the middle, with the effort force and resistance force at opposite ends. This kind of lever can change the direction of an applied force. That is, you can push down in order to lift a load up, or vice versa. Second and third class levers don't work that way. If the fulcrum is the same distance from the effort and resistance forces, then the lever won't provide a mechanical advantage. If the fulcrum is closer to the effort, then the mechanical advantage will be less than one. If the fulcrum is closer to the resistance, then the mechanical advantage will be greater than one. Can you think of any examples of first-class levers in the real world? An easy example might be a seesaw on a playground. Lots of different kinds of pry bars work like first-class levers. Tools like pliers or scissors are first-class levers with their fulcrum in the middle and their effort and resistance forces on either side. The handlebars of a bicycle work the same way to help you steer. Or you might think about the oars on a rowboat. The list could go on and on. A second class lever works a little differently. This time the fulcrum is positioned at one end and the effort force is applied to the other end and the resistance acts in the opposite direction to the effort somewhere in the middle between the fulcrum and effort force. Because of this configuration a second class lever will always have a mechanical advantage greater than one meaning that the force you put on the machine is always less than the force the machine puts onto the load but your force must travel farther than the load. Can you think of any examples of second-class levers in the real world? Here's a few you might recognize. A bottle opener works as a second-class lever. So does a paper shear, a wheelbarrow, a three-hole punch, and a nutcracker. These are second-class levers used in some simple, common household tools, but engineers might find lots of good reasons to use levers like these in far more complex machines, vehicles, and equipment. In a third-class lever, things are switched around once again. Here, the fulcrum is at one end of the lever, but this time the effort is being applied in the middle and the resistance force is applied further away from the fulcrum. This means that a third-class lever always has a mechanical advantage less than one-to-one. -one. So it takes more input force than the machine exerts on the load. But the input force is able to move through a smaller distance. So this type of lever can be used to increase how far the load moves, or to reduce how far the effort moves in situations where there isn't a lot of room for the effort force to do its thing. Can you think of any examples of third-class levers in the real world. A lot of sports equipment works like a third-class lever. In hockey sticks, baseball bats, and fishing poles, we're able to move our hands a relatively short distance, but the other end of the lever moves a much greater distance. And because they move farther in the same amount of time, they move a whole lot faster than we can move on the input. So we can cast lures farther and slap pucks faster than we could without the lever. Chopsticks, tweezers, and barbecue tongs are also good examples of third-class levers since we grip them closer to the fulcrum than the thing we're trying to pick up. Other tools like shovels and brooms also work as third-class levers and let us fling dirt or sweep floors through a greater distance than we're able to easily move our hands. Let's see how we can actually calculate the mechanical advantage of a lever. It works a little bit differently for the different classes of levers. In this example, we see a first-class lever with the fulcrum positioned right in the middle, two feet from both the effort and the resistance. Remember our formula for mechanical advantage? It's the distance of the effort over the distance of the resistance. In a lever, that means the distance from the force to the fulcrum. Our effort distance is two feet, and our resistance distance is two feet, so if we plug those numbers in and simplify, we can find the mechanical advantage to be one to one. But first class levers are pretty dynamic. Let's see one set up a little differently. In this first class lever, the fulcrum is a little closer to the resistance than the effort, making our effort distance three feet and our resistance distance one foot. If I plug these values into the mechanical advantage formula, 
I find the mechanical advantage of this lever to be three to one, meaning it could use one pound of effort force to lift three pounds of resistance. But the effort force will have to travel three times farther than the resistance. Now the lever has changed again. This time the fulcrum is closer to the effort, so if I plug in the new effort and resistance distances, I find the new mechanical advantage to be 1 to 3. That means that in order to lift a 1 pound load, I would need to apply 3 pounds of effort force. But I would be able to move the load 3 times farther than I had to move the input force. The other classes of lever follow the same rule about the distance from the fulcrum to the effort and resistance forces, but look at how the second class lever is configured differently. By definition, the resistance force is always closer to the fulcrum than the effort force in a second class lever. In this example, the effort is 4 feet from the fulcrum, and the resistance is only 1 foot from the fulcrum. So we have a mechanical advantage of 4 to 1. However I change these distances, the resistance is always closer to the fulcrum than the effort in a second class lever. So a second class lever always has a mechanical advantage greater than one. On the other hand, a third class lever has the opposite configuration. The resistance is always further from the fulcrum than the effort. So a third class lever will always have a mechanical advantage less than one. In this example, our resistance distance is four feet while the effort distance is one foot, so we get a mechanical advantage of one to four. We will have to apply four times the amount of effort force to lift the load, but we will only have to move one-fourth of the distance that the load moves. The shape of levers can become pretty complex in some mechanical designs, but the rules remain the same. If you can identify the fulcrum, effort, and resistance, then you should be able to figure out the distance of the effort and resistance forces from the fulcrum, and calculate the lever's mechanical advantage. Our next simple machine is the wheel and axle. It works in a similar way to the lever, but it's a little bit different in its practical application. The wheel and axle is a round disc with a rod fixed at its center, used to change the force or distance needed to move something. A wheel and axle can provide a mechanical advantage greater than one to one if the power is applied to the wheel and the wheel is used to drive the axle. It could also give us a mechanical advantage less than one to one if the power is applied to the axle and used to turn the wheel. Sometimes we use the wheel to drive the axle because we want to reduce the amount of force needed, like in a doorknob, a steering wheel, or a water spigot. Other times, power is applied to the axle and used to turn the wheel to produce a greater distance of motion on the output. This is what we see in car's wheels, ferris wheels, and the rear axle of a bicycle, just to name a few. To calculate the mechanical advantage, we need to know where to find the effort and resistance distances to use in our formula. When the axle drives the wheel, the axle is the effort. So the radius of the axle can be used as the effort distance and the radius of the wheel can be used as the resistance distance. In this example, the axle radius is one foot and the wheel radius is four feet, giving us a mechanical advantage of one to four. So we will need to apply four times the amount of effort force at the axle to overcome the resistance force at the wheel. But the distance traveled by the wheel will be four times greater than the distance traveled by the axle. In this example, the power is being applied to the wheel, which is then turning the axle. Think about the bus driver turning the steering wheel. Now the effort distance is four feet and the resistance distance is one foot, giving us a mechanical advantage of four to one. In other words, we would be able to lift or move four pounds at the axle by applying one pound of force to the wheel. As we talk more about simple machines, it helps to understand a couple of other concepts. Friction can create a bit of a problem when it comes to simple machines. Friction is the resistance that one surface or an object encounters when moving over another. Moving parts create friction where they touch each other. Machines with a larger number of moving parts or with more surface area in contact between parts will tend to create more friction. 
Different materials create different amounts of friction, and smoother surfaces make less friction than rough ones. So mechanical engineers are always looking for ways to reduce friction by using fewer moving parts, reducing the surface contact between moving parts, selecting low friction materials, machining contact surfaces to be as smooth as possible, and using lubricants where necessary. All of this is to improve a machine's efficiency, that is, the ratio of the useful work performed by a machine to the total energy expended on the machine. Friction means wasted energy. It causes mechanical energy put into a machine to convert into thermal heat energy, which can build up and even damage a machine. As a result, not all of the energy that goes into a machine gets used at the output. The efficiency of all machines is less than 100% but it's an ongoing goal to improve mechanical efficiency, to avoid wasted energy and improve performance. Pulleys are another way to use a wheel and axle, and they're different enough to deserve their own spot as one of the six types of simple machine. Pulleys might not be as common as some other simple machines in your day-to-day -day life, but you'd better believe they're all over the place, especially when things need to be hoisted the way a crane lifts cargo to move it around a shipping yard, or an engine hoist in a garage lifts large and heavy items in and out of vehicles. They're used to raise flags and sails when a great distance needs to be covered in an inconvenient spot. And they excel at changing the direction of an applied force, which is why we see pulleys used on exercise equipment at the gym. It allows people to lift weights straight up into the air, by applying force in lots of different directions, using lots of different muscle groups. A pulley is a wheel with a groove around its outer edge that is used to guide a rope, chain, or cable. When pulleys are arranged in combination with one another, they make a pulley system, which can change the direction or magnitude of force needed to move something. The simplest way to use a pulley would be as a single fixed pulley. In this configuration, one strand of rope is used to lift the load, and the other can be pulled in any direction to apply the force. The mechanical advantage of a single fixed pulley is always one-to-one. -one. It takes an effort, force, and distance equal to the load force and distance. It simply has the advantage of changing the direction of force required to do the lifting. A single movable pulley is a slightly different type of mechanism. In this arrangement, both strands of the rope are working to oppose the load force, and as a result, they share the load. This gives the single movable pulley a mechanical advantage of two to one. Only one half of the effort force is required to lift the load, but the load will only move one half of the distance that's pulled by the effort strand. You pull two feet of rope, and the load rises one foot. But if the load weighs 100 newtons, you will only have to pull with 50 newtons of force. By combining fixed and movable pulleys and running a continuous length of rope through them, we can create a block and tackle, which further increases mechanical advantage. In this example, there are four strands of rope opposing the load, giving the block and tackle a four to one mechanical advantage. The fifth strand, the effort strand, is not counted in this example because it's acting in the same direction as the load, not against it. The mechanical advantage of a pulley system can be figured out in this way without calculation by counting the number of strands opposing the load. Or you can calculate it using the formula effort distance over resistance distance where the effort distance is the length of rope pulled by the effort and the resistance distance is the distance moved by the load in the same action. Level two of the Simple Machines lesson will get into a few more peculiarities about pulley systems. The inclined plane is a simple machine that works a little differently. It's a sloping ramp used to raise or lower heavy objects. Just like levers and wheels, an inclined plane can reduce the amount of effort force needed to lift something by increasing the distance that the effort force is applied. Can you think of any examples of inclined planes in the real world? Sometimes inclined planes are used to reduce the amount of force needed to lift something, like with a loading ramp or a wheelchair ramp. Other times, a ramp is used to change the direction of a force, as with a skateboard ramp. Or, inclined planes could be used to increase the distance something will travel, like with rain gutters designed to take rainwater far away from a structure, 
or slides designed to provide a longer controlled ride to the ground instead of, you know, a straight drop. The mechanical advantage of an inclined plane is calculated just like the other simple machines, but you should know that the distance of the effort is the length of the sloped surface of the inclined plane, and the distance of the resistance is the height. The horizontal distance covered by the ramp is not used in this calculation. Simple machines exist to help us do work. We'll explore work further in level two, but you should know that work is actually a technical term. We can quantify it, we can calculate it, and we can mechanically change the way work is done. Simple machines do this by trading force for distance. They do not change the amount of work that's done. One more time, simple machines do not change the amount of work that is done. They help us do the work in a better way. Work is done when force is applied over a distance. Mathematically, work equals force times distance. In the US, we use pounds to measure force feet to measure distance, and foot-pounds to measure work. In the rest of the world, force is measured in newtons, distance is measured in meters, and work is measured in newton meters. As I said already, simple machines do not change the amount of work that's done. The amount of work you put into a machine is the same as the amount of work you get out. Of course, some energy might be lost as friction, but we'll talk more about efficiency in level two. Since work equals force times distance, we can expand our work in equals work out formula like this, so that the effort force times the effort distance is equal to the resistance force times the resistance distance. This is also known as the static equilibrium formula. In the inclined plane example shown below, we can see that the force of the resistance is 200 pounds, which needs to be lifted two feet. The effort force is 20 pounds using the inclined plane, but must be applied over 20 feet. Either way, 400 foot pounds of work is done with or without the simple machine. But with the simple machine, we're able to reduce the amount of effort force that's needed by increasing the amount of distance. In this application, that makes life a whole lot easier for the wheelchair user. Our next simple machine is the wedge which is a tapered piece of material that is driven into or between objects to split or secure them. A wedge is very similar to an inclined plane in principle, but where an inclined plane is used stationary and an object is moved over it, a wedge is usually driven into or between stationary objects. The wedge is the object in motion. They change the direction of the applied force and can also change the magnitude of the force. Can you think of any real life examples of a wedge being used as a simple machine? A doorstop is a good example of a wedge being used to secure something. Nails are wedges that work in a similar way. Pretty much all cutting tools are wedges designed to split material in two. As simple as they appear, wedges can provide a large mechanical advantage. The mechanical advantage of a wedge can be found with our trusty formula effort distance over resistance distance. But you've got to know which distances to use in the formula. The effort distance is the length of the wedge parallel to the applied force. The resistance distance is the distance across the wedge perpendicular to the line of action of the applied force. The sixth simple machine is another variation on the inclined plane called a screw. A screw is a ridge or a groove wrapped in a spiral around a cylinder. We usually use them to move or secure things. They can produce a very high mechanical advantage because they're basically a very long inclined plane wrapped into a smaller space. Because screws are usually driven into another piece of material with lots of surface area contact and friction, they tend to have very low efficiencies. Can you think of any real-life examples of screws other than, you know, screws? Of course, the screw is used far and wide on lots of different kinds of threaded fasteners like screws, bolts, and nuts, but we also see them used as a spiral inclined plane to remove material and drill bits and augers. 
Spiral staircases and parking structures work like screws by curving an inclined plane to get a high mechanical advantage in a small physical footprint. Clamps and vices use screws to tightly secure things together. And lead screws, like these on a 3D printer, can be used to precisely control linear motion, making something slide back and forth in tiny measured increments. Calculating the mechanical advantage of a screw is a little tricky, so I decided to cover it in level 2 instead of here in level 1. If you want to learn more about simple machines, work, mechanical advantage, efficiency, and compound machines, you should give level 2 a try. Thanks for watching, and good luck!